Good afternoon, and thank you for joining today's Wednesday Wisdom Program featuring Vice Admiral Jeffrey Tressler. And now a video from our sponsor, Mantech. Mantech is widely recognized as the expert in advanced cyber. Our advanced offensive cyber capabilities are ever-changing and evolving. Mantech's partnership with the intelligence community provides a unique ability to deter foreign adversaries. Cutting-edge defensive cyber draws from our extensive experience in offensive cyber. The threat is very real, the enemy persistent, and you don't get a second chance. Now, please welcome INSA Executive Vice President John Doyen. Good afternoon, and thank you for joining us for Wednesday Wisdom. We're pleased to welcome today one of our community's senior leaders and a longstanding friend of INSA's to this program. Before we begin, let me make a few housekeeping notes. First, we do hope to make this session as, as interactive as possible. So if you have questions to submit today, please use the Q&A box on the right side of your screen. We have nearly 500 registrations this afternoon and we'll do our best to get to as many questions as possible. Second, we're pleased to welcome members of the press to the call today. And this is a reminder that today's session is on the record. And last, I'd like to thank our sponsor, Mantech, for their critical support of this program. We could not provide this type of thought leadership without the support of our partners. Now I'm pleased to welcome David Britt, who many of you may know by his call sign, Tuba, who is Technology Director for Mantech's Defense Sector Navy Division. Tuba, over to you. Thank you, John. Uh, Mantech is delighted to sponsor today's INSA Wednesday Wisdom event with uh, Vice Admiral Jeffrey Trussler. Uh, Mantech delivers offense-informed defense by leading the effort to design and deliver the joint warfighter warfighting architecture and the joint common access platform, as well as proofing cyber training at sea with our secure tactical edge platform's participation in the Navy Integration and Contested Environments Advanced Naval Technical Experiment aboard Stiletto this spring. Mantech's comprehensive all-of-government approach helps safeguard national security by protecting critical infrastructure, networks, and data while stopping sophisticated cyber attacks virtually on contact. Now, it's my privilege to introduce today's guest speaker, Vice Admiral Jeffrey Trussler. Vice Admiral Trussler hails from the great state of Oklahoma and is a cowboy and a Sooner as he has an undergraduate degree from Oklahoma State as well as a master's degree from the University of Oklahoma. A career submariner, he commanded the ballistic missile submarine USS Maryland and was the first commander of Task Force 69 for the U.S. Sixth Fleet in Naples, Italy. His flag assignments include serving as the first commander of the Undersea Warfighting Development Center and as director of future plans on the Navy staff. He is the current Navy staff in two and six, where he is in charge of the Navy's intelligence activities, including cyber operations, and serves as the Navy's deputy chief information officer. Welcome, Vice Admiral, Vice Admiral Tressler. Thank you, Tuba. Hey, I appreciate the intro. And, uh, you know, uh, submariners and P3 Bubba's were close cousins in the Navy and anti-submarine warfare. So thank you. And uh, John, nice to meet you. Thank you for having me here today. Well, thank you. And thank you, Tuba and to Mantech for supporting this program. And, and Admiral, we're so glad you can join us here this afternoon. And um, to get our conversation started, I thought I'd, I'd um, ask you to tell us some about your role uh, as both the Deputy Chief of Naval Operations for Information Warfare and the Director of Naval Intelligence and the principal missions that you have. Wow, thank you. You know, I, I just got to say, you know, how, how lucky am I uh, to get this job uh, last June and take over for Matt Kohler uh, in this position. Uh, you know, about, not, about 11 years ago, in November 2009, the Navy created the Information uh, Warfare Community at the time. Mm -hmm. It was called Information Dominance. And, uh, you know, as a Navy staff, they had the uh, the traditional N6 role who did communication C4I systems, and they had the director of naval intelligence, uh, the N2. And uh, one of the things that was done back then, it was, it was seen as needed. Looking back, you know, you got to say, wow, I can't believe I didn't do this sooner. 
uh, but they combined those roles uh, on the on the on the uh, Navy staff uh, to be the N2, N6, Deputy Chief of Naval Operations for Information Warfare. And since then, there's been a long journey uh, that's still evolving. When we've created a, a type commander, Information Forces down in Norfolk, and the Naval Information Warfighting Development Center, we're still evolving that concept. But uh, in my role, uh, mainly, I'm a resource sponsor, budget stuff. Uh, to support the fleet we have now and the fleet we're uh, trying to build for the future. And that's for uh, communication systems, nuclear command and control systems, uh, tactical data links, ISR capabilities, which is a nice mix uh, with the intelligence community and the intelligence hat role overall, our enterprise business systems, our own oceanographic and meteorology uh, systems, and uh, and then uh, a policy role, uh, whether that be a cyber, ocean, uh, ocean systems policies, uh, intelligence, and so forth. So I've got a fascinating job, and it's just a privilege uh, to be able to do that and work with the folks I, uh, I get to work with here. Uh, well, it sounds like there's a, a wide scope of things that you, you're responsible for. Um, well, let me ask you, so it's a new year and a new administration. Uh, looking ahead to 2021 and beyond, what are your top priorities and challenges uh, as we enter the new year? Oh, great question. And, and uh, as you say, the uh, you know administration has just turned over, so we ex we expect uh, you know a lot of uh, some changes in emphasis uh, potentially. Uh, you know, there, you know, lots of rumors, lots of lots of things in the news about my, what might be happening. But uh, you know, the Navy uh, is already you know underway. Uh, you know, with some transformation and with some roadmaps uh, that we put out. In fact, uh, so, you know, my goals, our goals in the Navy are, are one, uh, to support the CNO's navigation plan. He just recently released that earlier this month uh, at a uh, surface warfare officer uh, symposium. And uh, this is uh, his effort to get after a uh, more lethal and better connected fleet. And uh, the way he phrases it in there, and we're going to close the kill chain faster than our rivals with a resilient web of uh, sensors, command and control nodes, platforms, and weapons. And I'll talk a little bit more about that depending on the questions we get. But uh, the CNOs laid out some bold goals for us. You'll probably hear a little bit more about that in the future. Mm -hmm. But that navigation plan lines up very well with the uh, tri-service maritime strategy, the advantage uh, uh, at sea. Uh, uh, integrated all domain naval power, we call it. Very similar themes about the potential adversaries we must uh, prepare for, you know, Russia and China. And the, uh, the fact that we, between the Navy, the Marine Corps, and the Coast Guard, uh, now more than ever have to be interoperable units and we have to make uh, investment decisions uh, wisely, not be duplicative, but supportive. Uh, and collaborative in that. Uh, so those big focus for us. And then uh, you will hear, hear specifically in the Navy uh, in the C4I realm that's going to support us in all of information warfare <clears throat> is uh, Project Overmatch. I know that's gotten some uh, some uh, support in the news about uh, mm -hmm. connecting our weapons, our sensors, our platforms uh, in an agnostic manner to the decision makers. Mm -hmm. And uh, so those are the three goals that I have in N2 and six to support the Navy. It's supporting those strategy and emphasizing our investments and our efforts towards that. Okay. Talking about a little bit about investments, do you have some, uh, can you share some of the uh, major investments that you're looking at um, uh, in the coming year? Right. So uh, we're going to be, uh, uh, we're looking hard at uh, everything having to do uh, with cyber and shoring up our systems quite a bit. Uh, you know, obviously there's a lot of activity and, uh, you know, something, uh, uh, you know, I've, I've learned quite a bit in this job in eight short months, uh, mm -hmm. the importance and, uh, you know, frankly, the battle going on every day. But uh, mainly from the standpoint of the man, train and equip of the forces we have to, uh, to, uh, to invest in, the capabilities we need to provide those forces uh, supporting the Fleet Cyber Command, uh, 10th Fleet that are in support uh, of Generals Nakasone at, uh, at Cyber Command. And uh, so there's a, a lot of effort we have to put forth uh, there. And we have to uh, be robust uh, in our, uh, our, our, our resilient command and control uh, communication systems and to make sure we shore those up. And uh, so there's a lot of, uh, lot of effort there uh, that's going to be going on. Can't get ahead of the budget process. It's ongoing. That's a dynamic situation right now. Yeah. 
but uh, you'll, you'll hear the CNO talk a lot about fleet readiness and not just the investments in the capabilities we have, but we have to make sure we get the man trained and equipped right. So when we're putting things out there, we have training facilities available and ready for them, training processes for them, uh, spare parts, the whole of the kill chain that makes the engine move uh, for the Navy. So that's uh, that's a big emphasis for us is to get that balance and wholeness right no matter what we're putting out. Yeah. Hey, you mentioned cyber. I wanted to, to uh, uh, circle back to that for a second. Um, uh, of course, uh, probably no, uh, no surprise to anyone that there's uh, significant cyber investments being planned, um, especially in light of the solar winds attack recently, uh, the Russian solar winds attack. So that reminds us that you know solar winds reminds us of the significant cyber threat that's posed by our adversaries. And I'm I'm curious, you know, at this time, do you, do you have any lessons learned from that event? And what is the Navy doing, um, you know, short term to address some of the cybersecurity challenges you're facing? Yeah. So, uh, wow. Every day. And I, I know that uh, the folks that participate in this forum uh, uh, probably uh, have a lot more experience and knowledge than I do in this area. But uh, let me tell you, it's a battle every single day. Uh, the good news is is uh, we're uh, minimally uh, almost no impact uh, by the solar winds event, uh, to my knowledge, uh, as of this morning, uh, by the great work by uh, Fleet Cyber Command, Vice Admiral Myers and his team uh, to jump on that quickly under uh, General Nakasone's leadership. And uh, what I'll tell you, it, it just it reinforces for us uh, how we uh, are going to have to battle every day, and these, you know, these sort of lines of effort that we have to take to look at this. So, if you remember our our uh, our, uh, our cybersecurity review that SecNav Spencer directed for us a couple mm -hmm. of years ago, uh, probably the biggest things, you know, some of the biggest things we've done since then, uh, and 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 from some longer term and short term items. So, you know, one, we reestablished the position of the chief information uh, officer under Mr. Aaron Weiss about 18 months ago. Mm -hmm. Previously, the duties that fell under the uh, uh, you know cybersecurity world and chief information officer, uh, you know, kind of held on the undersecretary's job. So we reestablished that position. We brought in a ringer uh, from uh, from industry who was who was uh, working up in uh, OSD. Mr. Weiss has challenged mm -hmm. us at every turn with how to think differently, how to approach how we uh, look at our systems differently. Uh, and so forth. And he's uh, put forth the uh, information superiority vision to uh, modernize, uh, innovate, and defend it. He's put together a tremendous team uh, upon the secretariat staff. In the in the near term and short term, things we've been doing that were started uh, before I got here and some things that we're doing now, uh, uh, are high-risk systems. We evaluate our systems uh, independently, and uh, if they're into a high-risk category, uh, we treat them a little differently and give them some more scrutiny. And uh, we, we, we found that we weren't moving the needle on them enough. And so uh, my mm -hmm. predecessor directed a stand down and said, we have to change how we deal with these. And we've brought those down uh, about 50% over the last year. And we've put in implementation and uh, mitigation plans to attack those vice, just kind of living with them and uh, having black and white solutions. We're finding solutions in the middle ground middle ground to reduce that risk. Uh, our uh, how, the, how we evaluate those systems, the risk manage, management framework, the authority to operate uh, that we provide, uh, a lot of uh, redundancy and bureaucracy in that process that we're just attacking and uh, I'm slashing with every authority I have to make that lean and to make processes value added. So we've got to get faster and more agile in evaluating the systems. We're attacking that right now. We're, we're evaluating all the Navy IT systems. We have a lot of systems, and this is something under that uh, Mr. Weiss has, uh, has uh, inspired and led for us. Uh, we've got a lot of legacy and accepted systems that aren't, say, for example, part of our, our enterprise systems, the next generation uh, Navy networks. Again, we call it includes an MCI, OneNet, things like that. Are we being redundant? Uh, the more redundant, the more you have, the harder it is for us to monitor, uh, defend, and uh, protect. We're taking some steps to add some efficiency and agility into known vulnerabilities and how we're going to patch, uh, taking into some lessons learned. We're learning throughout the Navy and the perform to plan process uh, that Fleet Cybercom uh, under Ross Myers is, uh, is leading. So just a, a lot of things that we're doing to get after this. We can't slow down. We can't be complacent. 
And, uh, you know, I've never really been a fan of the word cyber hygiene, but we are got to reemphasize with the team, especially in this telework environment, uh, because we are now a little more distributed right now, taking advantage of collaboration tools. Now more than ever, we have to be vigilant because we're creating potential vulnerabilities and weak points uh, that we have to pay attention to. Hey, you mentioned um, being faster and more agile, which is, I think, something we all aim to do. Um, uh, and I noticed last week the Navy announced uh, the establishment of a DevSecOps task force, which looking to bring this best practice uh, to the Navy more fully. Um, and I'm curious, what are your efforts or what are your expectations for that effort and how adoption of the DevSecOps approach uh, could help with cybersecurity? No, absolutely. And I think it's I think it's well known uh that uh, the ability to, uh, uh, to to utilize devsecops uh to evaluate uh, uh software to get it uh to uh to test uh, to innovate uh to rapidly incorporate uh ideas uh and get those onto systems and understand their vulnerabilities and their security posture and and as we have uh, as a navy and I'm, I'm sure lots of big organizations figure out how to do that let the thousand flowers bloom a little bit and uh, don't stifle at the beginning and try to over coordinate. But we're now at the point where multiple organizations, systems command that do this for us uh, are starting potentially to invent their own processes and investments and licenses that it's uh, now about the time it was recognized. OK, now we need a bit more of a governance structure. Let's mm -hmm. buy it once, use it a lot and uh and uh take what we've learned uh throughout the navy and the various commands that have uh, started some of these efforts and get it right early before we duplicate unnecessarily and that I mean, we we approach it for the you know we think we have to think about uh, systems from a shipboard perspective mm -hmm. we have multiple types of systems on ships that uh without a task force or an approach like this we might invent and do something for this system and something very similar for this system. These systems are going to talk anyway, and they have similar characteristics. So that task force is going to identify some of those efficiencies and best practices we can take and uh, not be duplicative and be more efficient in how we invest our resources. Mm -hmm. I wanted to shift the, the topic a little bit, Admiral, to uh, the Great Powers competition. And, um, you know, as we look at Great Powers a competition, uh, increased focus on uh, Russia and China, um, uh, we've had a couple of questions uh, come in. One is from Joe Kerr with BAE Systems, and he asked, you know, with the emphasis uh, on intelligence that's focused on great power competition, what enhancements uh, does Navy intelligence uh, need uh, as you, you tackle these challenges with great power, power competition? Oh, no, good question. Uh, great power competition. We're talking about Russia and China, and I always throw a shout out to them because I'm sure they're listening right now uh, also. And uh, here's here's where naval intelligence is involved. And this is, uh, you know, uh, as a career, you know, uh, you know, submariner, uh, I, you know, close, close cousin, uh, you know, warfare community that's very interested uh, in the intelligence business. But, you know, my first opportunity to kind of work uh, as an, you know, with the intelligence professionals uh, directly and help lead that community. Uh, but I, I come in with this uh, as I as I learn in our business and how it fits into the Navy and how the Navy fits into the larger intelligence community. Uh, here's how I describe how the Navy fits in that and what we need and where we use it. So, one, uh, I've been just blown away by the uh, professionals, expertise, and capabilities of the United States intelligence community uh, and all its agencies. I mean, just professionals, top to bottom, smartest people I've ever met. So we have a tremendous network, a very collaborative network. And so the United States intelligence community pulls in loads uh, of data that the nation needs. And so one of the things Naval Intelligence does is we sift that information out that the Navy specifically needs in the maritime environment. We are the experts in collating that, sifting through that, mm -hmm. how it's going to apply uh, to what might transpire in warfare in the naval environment, how we might get decision advantage. That's why we, that's that's our purpose, to get decision advantage. Uh, and, and, uh, and, and to collect and assimilate that for our acquisition, our engineering decisions, our, our threats. So, you know, that's pretty obvious. So we, we call 
out what the greater intelligence community brings for us. Two, we're a global force. The Navy is a global force by nature, 24-7, 365. So we've got presence around the world every day near our allies, near our adversaries. We're on the high seas, in the air, under the sea. So with that presence, we take advantage of that presence and we can collect intelligence. So that's one way naval intelligence. We outfit uh, and utilize the presence we have around the world uh, globally. So those two sources fill a lot of gaps and provide us a lot of information that we need to prepare ourselves for that information advantage uh, over the adversaries and great power competition. But then we still have gaps. There are still things that we need to know and want to know. Then that's where we come in and we decide, okay, the intelligence community as a whole hasn't pulled in some information we need here. Uh, our presence around the world has added to that, but not necessarily. Therefore, that's where we stick some of our investments in going after and filling those gaps that we need uh, to close to help us understand our adversaries, whether that's the investments in, in equipment that we're going to put on some of our platforms or how we're going to conduct some of our intelligence operations with the platforms we have or how we're going to engage the intelligence community specifically to close some critical gaps for us to help us understand uh, the kill chain we need to close or what some vulnerabilities uh, to attack in their kill chains. Okay. Um, again, thinking about great power competition, we, we have another question in from Tony Capaccio, uh, who's actually with Bloomberg News. He asked. Um, for your views and assessment on the status of China's uh, anti-ship ballistic missile, the DF-21D. Uh, and he wants to know if China's fully fielded this weapon now and its force structure, and in particular, is, do we know if it's in the South China Sea area? Oh, yeah, okay, the DF-21, uh, the carrier killer. Uh, the right. Maybe, you know, we, uh, Obviously, uh, obviously, uh, as a naval force, we track, uh, and specifically in our intelligence efforts, we track very closely the capabilities of our adversaries, and specifically those that might impact us on the high seas. So we watch that very closely. Uh, I can't say that they've. Uh, I, I don't know that, that we, you know, that we can say that that's been fully fielded uh, mm -hmm. yet. But we're watching. We're watching uh, their, uh, you know, shorter range, 1500 meter, their longer range, 4,000 uh, kilometer, 4,000 kilometer DF-26. Uh, we know they're out there. Uh, we've, uh, you, you've heard Admiral Davidson at Indo-PACOM, uh, you know, publicly comment that they've uh, seen them test that uh, mm -hmm. against a moving target. And uh, I don't, uh, you know, we're I'm not going to get much more detail of what we know and don't know about it, but they're pouring a lot of money in the ability to uh to you know basically you know rim rim their coasts in the south china sea with anti-ship missile capability it's okay. a destabilizing effort uh in the south china sea uh in the east china sea all those all those areas uh when uh, their claims uh, of some of these contested islands that are militarizing uh, those areas uh, that's something we're going to watch uh, very closely. It's something that uh, confuses the international order and uh, concerns the allies in the region. It's one reason we work to keep uh, the global commons open and the free flow, free flow of traffic. Uh, but when you see that, those are troubling developments. They're probably aimed and uh, specifically uh, uh, developed uh, towards the United States Navy. So we watch them very closely. I hope they just keep pouring money into that type of thing. Uh, that may not be how we win the next war. Okay. Hey, shifting to another uh, threat uh, uh, to U.S. interests, um, let's talk just for a moment about Iran and Iran naval operations. Um, and so, you know, they had a recent cruise missile test and a, a launch uh, from Iran of a missile against the ship in the Indian Ocean. It just reminds us that, you know, I, Iran poses a, a threat to our interests. Um, do you have any comments on your views, uh, you know, and your concerns regarding Iran? Wow. <clears throat> Another, and it's very specifically destabilizing force, you know, in the Middle East. Mm -hmm. uh, and uh, we, we're all well aware uh, of the proxy groups they use and their support of the Houthis and other destabilizing organizations throughout the region. But from a maritime perspective, they sit at one of the great choke points of the world. 
Okay, they are, uh, as I call it, the starboard side of the Strait of Hormuz, mm -hmm. and they they regularly threaten. They, they have publicly threatened uh, many times over the years uh, the shutdown of the strait, uh, the attacking of free-flowing free traffic. Uh, they have regularly stopped uh, tankers uh, and, uh, and uh, sniffed around closely, snooped uh, our warships coming, uh, coming in and out of the strait. And uh, they could be a very uh, destabilizing force on the high seas just just because of their location. So we're very concerned. And uh, the Middle East, although uh, known largely over the last couple of decades uh, for, for the land operations and, and work that's going on there, it is a maritime concern. It is a big maritime uh, region and choke point. And uh, the amount of, you know, on a daily basis from, country, from a lot of countries and coalitions uh, working to keep uh, uh, the, the the region and the free flow of traffic stabilized, but you know any given day there's a Chinese task force over there. There's Iranian naval task group out there. Uh, there's a combined military force, uh, you know, led by our uh, fifth fleet commander Sam Paparo, uh, out there uh, that's patrolling the region. Mm -hmm. uh, but that one little strait where a lot of oil goes in and out every day that could disrupt the world markets, uh, that is a potential. Uh, that is a, that choke point is a real potential flare up. Uh, should a country like Iran uh, do something stupid uh, and uh, impact the rest of the world and uh, the free flow of commerce there. So that is a big concern. We watch it closely. That's why we're there, uh, to keep that free flow of traffic moving every day. Okay. And let's uh, switch to a topic that we've gotten actually a lot of questions about, um, which is the, the topic of the Joint All Domain Command and Control Initiative, or uh, JADC2. Um, and uh, there's a lot of uh, questions about um, your views of JADC2 and, um, and how the Navy will interact with its fellow services uh, and the role that ISR will play. My favorite topic. Yeah, uh, JADC2 gets a lot of press, and uh, I, I, there's probably a lot of frustration out there because, uh, you know, about a year, uh, year and a half ago, uh, an announcement, uh, an initiative, something said, hey, joint all domain command and control. Uh, we're going to do that. And, uh, you know, perfect. Great. Uh, we'd like to see the blueprint. We'd like to see the flyer. Mm -hmm. What are you doing next? How much will it cost? And when will it show up? And uh, really, uh, you know, it starts out as the concept and we're working on that. So let me let me back up a little bit. Uh, I'll give the Navy perspective and how we're working with the other services. So uh all the services but specifically the navy we, we put out some tremendous platforms we put out uh platforms you know ships aircraft submarines that we outfit with organic sensors with which to defend itself and to provide some uh, offensive effects we'll call them and we're very good at uh, producing weapons that we can take uh, with our organic sensors and put uh, metal and explosive on targets. Mm -hmm. Okay. Uh, where we may not be the best or originally we're good at is, well, wait a minute, why can't we take targeting information from somewhere else and send that down to the weapon system or into that weapon system in an in-flight update? We can do that. We have, we have over the last decade with our Navy integrated fire control and some other efforts, uh, taken a lot of those baby steps where we can communicate, we can pass weapons uh, data over tactical data links. But we have now got to the point where we said, you know what, uh, between between our, between our uh, the satellites we have, between the aircraft we have in the air, the ships at sea, the submarines out there, we need to be able to take sensor data from any of those, or even if they're not platform-based sensors that, that, that we may have out there. And it needs to be sort of path agnostic, recipient agnostic, and get targeting data or sensor data to the users, to the to the best weapon, not all weapons, but to the best weapon, and to the decision makers. So that is a concerted effort the Navy has. We call that project overmatch. You've probably seen a little bit about that uh, in the press. That is our effort now to step one, the systems we have in place, we can't just toss everything we have and start over. We have a 297 ship, you know, Navy and a couple of thousand aircraft. We can't just 
uh, on a dime turn that. We've got to make the systems we have now work together and every future system we make, it's got to be interleaked and interwoven and built to work together. Every service independently has also come to that same conclusion. Uh, the Army and the Air Force, the Marine Corps working uh, with the Navy. Uh, you'll hear the uh, Army call it Project uh, Overmatch. You'll hear the Navy call it the Advanced Battle Management uh, System. When you, all three services, know they have same challenges and are working and make, making great strides in solving those problems, then as a joint force, the services, we all have to work together. That's what JADC2 is all about. So there's not an answer yet. There's not a spec sheet yet. Mm -hmm. uh, led by Dennis Crawl, uh, uh, the J6, uh, you know, up on the joint staff, putting together the strategy right now that we're reviewing. And we're going to start working together and closing those gaps we have to fill in our operational plan with the capabilities we currently have and then how we're going to build the capabilities that we're going to need to make us ever tight. No matter the platform, the service it's from, the weapon it needs to get to, or the sensor it's coming from, that's going to be very powerful. That's our goal. Okay. Thank you for that. Um, I think that probably covers most of the questions we had on that topic. Um, so let me move, move to something else. And we've actually, um, uh, we have a question in from Tish Long uh, here. Um, who Big fan of Tish Long. Thanks you for joining us. Um, and so she asked you um, a question. Oops. <laughs> uh, my technology is failing me here. Here we go. Uh, she says, it's always great to hear from you. Um, and she asked a personnel uh, related aspect. Um, um, can you talk to the personnel aspects, both military and civilian, uh, about how recruiting and retention is going and how folks are doing during the pandemic and work from home? Right. So let me let me start with the pandemic. <clears throat> Interesting. Uh, so uh, there, you know, I, I, I uh, the pandemic has been uh, tragic, obviously, uh, but in the how it impacts. Uh, us here at work and what we do, like many organizations, uh, you know, my perspective and in the Navy, some things have happened. So one, it's it's provided uh, some opportunity for us because in 20, now as we sit here in 2020 and now 2021, it, you would think that the greatest nation in the world would have much better capabilities and have evolved its workplace structures to be able to telework seamlessly in many cases. Yeah. We still have trouble on snow days, you know, quite mm -hmm. frankly. Well, of course, we haven't had any in D.C. in a while, uh, where it's, it's caused us to open our eyes and realize that out in the uh, commercial sector, even other government agencies, I've got a neighbor that told me, oh, yeah, we were we were we were required to work two days a week from home during every during pay periods before this pandemic. So this was an this was an easy switch for us. Really, I, you know, I didn't know that. Uh, we realized that when we in the Navy needed to shift to and reduce the manning in some of our office spaces down to 25 or 40 percent, depending on the, on the time, we need we can't just stop working. What is our ability to telework? We had to rapidly upgrade the capacity of our virtual private network access and our Outlook web access uh, to get to, you know, just simple things like email. Uh, those folks who had work laptops, we needed that VPN access to, you know, up, you know, up it up. I mean, we're talking, you know, we went from something less than uh, w well under the 20,000, uh, you know, access points that we had, you know, we in increased it to over 90,000 and we're topping out about 90,000 average peak, you know, every day. That just tells you, oh, we, we were able to do it somewhat. But the collaboration tools, the things, the processes by which we might do that and how we might function. It's not just about technology. It's about culture. So so we have learned a lot of things and uh, it's going to force us. It's going to force us 21 years in uh, to get into the 21st century and do business a little differently. Uh, the bad side of it is uh, uh, we uh, this is INSA intelligence and national security. Uh, we deal with a lot of classified things. So. 
Uh, a lot of the folks uh, that work with me and for me, that work over with the Office of Naval Intelligence uh, in the building here, we work in SCIFs. We do a lot of our work in SCIFs, mm -hmm. multiple classified systems. So that has made a little challenge, but that's just that's just leadership challenges. That's just how you manage the workforce. It's whether it's, uh, you know, just a brute force, uh, blue gold on off, whether it's uh, you minimize uh, interaction by uh, having early teams and late teams. Uh, there are multiple ways that each organization uh, here in the building and throughout the Navy uh, are, are adapting uh, to get their work done. We're learning, uh, we're learning some things, but it has forced us uh, to think a little differently. But I'll tell you, the workforce, uh, it's frustrated me personally in this job starting in the pandemic because I'm a walk around management by walking around guy. And uh, when I go to our spaces, and realize we are adhering to our current policy of only about 40% manning, you know, it's, it's been a struggle for me to meet and, uh, and see everybody and get around because we just have a t such a talented workforce. The opportunity side of that is, wow, let's just set up a virtual event and boom, everybody's online. So instead, mm -hmm. of, instead of the pack of everybody going down to the 600 person theater in the Pentagon, we can just do it online. And so we've done a couple of those sessions. So that's, you know, how we're managing dealing with the workforce uh, right now during the pandemic. Uh, what, was, okay. what was the other part of that question? I'm sorry. Um, I think you touched on it. It was, it was the work from home piece for the, uh, uh, and how that was going for the work from home. So, hey, we got a, we're got about 10 minutes. So we're going to try to squeeze in a couple more questions here. Sure. Um, uh, one of our listeners, Callie uh, McNaughton asked, what are the Navy intelligence enterprise top technology needs and how can private industry best support you? So do you have any top uh... technology needs? Yeah. So uh, good question. You know, uh, you got to be careful in forums like this to talk about the gaps you may have or the uh, vulnerabilities you may have. But uh, I'll tell you. We, we uh, uh, every advancement uh, that exists, we need for uh, 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 AI, ML, we need to just suck in and, and learn from. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, the challenge we have, uh, not just Navy Intel or information warfare, is the amount of data and information that is out there. And we're, we're well beyond the point where uh, it's room full of analysts, whether it's it's handling uh, you know information coming in uh, in whatever form of digital, whether that be uh, whether that be uh, reports, whether that be open source intelligence, whether it be uh, you know SIGINT or uh, you know whether it be acoustic intelligence, uh, you know we 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 we're going to have to put machines on that. We're going to have to put the algorithms in place to manage it. And what I'll tell you is uh, very proud of where uh, Navy intelligence uh, actually is on that. Uh, over at the Acoustic Intelligence Agency, they have some tremendous AI projects uh, underway uh, that are getting after that. Uh, obviously, in the maritime environment, uh, mm -hmm. in all the domains from seabed to space, there are many that uh, deal in the uh, surface domain, the air domain, the space domain, cyber domain. There is one service and organization that deals undersea, and that's the United States Navy. And uh, that is the domain where we still have a large uh, dominant margin. And it is because of that management of the acoustic intelligence and uh, some of the tools and things we have there. But we need to keep pressing and uh, keep learning uh, in that arena. So uh, Kelly Oshbach and team uh, over at uh, the Acoustic Intelligence Agency are doing tremendous work on those fronts. But in a technology need, I think across the board, uh, AI, ML is, one, is top. But I'll also say from industry, uh, back on sort of the C4I, uh, JADC2 Project Overmatch, what you can expect to see, I think, from all the services uh, but particularly the Navy, and particularly when we're talking about it. So one, I'll say, keep pressing us. The innovation and the ideas from industry are huge. Keep pressing us. Keep knocking on the door. Keep showing us what's, what's available and what you can do. Mm -hmm. The caution I'll give you is we're not going to be very satisfied with proprietary. 
We're going to be more interested in how is this going to leak into the systems we have? How is this going to help us advance a collaborative web to close our kill chains? And uh, we're going to, we're just, we can never again uh, invest in and, and uh, mm -hmm. solve our problems with proprietary things that we can't crack open, that aren't open architecture that we can, uh, you know, link in with the rest of our systems. Hopefully that answers the question. Okay, thank you. Yeah, we have a lot of interest, a lot of different questions on AIML, which is where I was going to go next, and you, you just hit on it. So uh, thank you for that. Um, hey, um, let me ask you one more question here. Um, you know, events throughout our country this past year uh, have led many organizations to emphasize their commitment to diversity, equity, and inclusion. And the armed forces and the intelligence community are no different. Um, what do you do as a leader to uh, ensure that everyone in Navy intelligence and the IW community is valued and heard, and that they all have equal opportunities to advance and contribute to the mission. Right. No, uh, thank you. You know, uh, Ms. Long actually asked me a, a, a very similar question in a, in a, in a previous forum uh, sometime last year. And, uh, you know, I had, a, I had a long way to come personally uh, in this area. And uh, you can you can you can see me. I'm I'm a, I'm the I'm the white male uh, kind of gray-haired uh, you know demographic here, and coming from uh, you know the submarine community like I do, uh, just for the first 111 years, uh, purely a male-only uh, you know community, and uh, so uh, and I did most of my operational tours in many of my staff tours uh, just with the submarine community. So I had a kind of a skewed view of, uh, you know, the military as a whole, uh, just because even a lot of the staffs, uh, because they're submarine oriented staffs, a lot of uh, submariners there, mainly male. It wasn't until I, uh, you know, came to the, you know, about 11, uh, 12 years ago, came to the joint staff, coming to work in the Pentagon and started seeing the greater, uh, the, the, the services. And uh, that uh, that uh, wow, we do have uh, a lot of women, a lot of minorities out there. So at first, I'm like, we must be doing pretty good. I, mm -hmm. it's everywhere, I am surprised. But uh, you know, I've got my cage rattled a couple of times uh, by not realizing how far we still have to go, where we're somewhat in our uh, junior ranks, uh, especially for example, in the active duty, where we're overrepresented, you know, by minorities and underrepresented, you know, in the officer or senior ranks. We've got mm -hmm. a lot of work to do there from the active duty standpoint. Uh, on the uh, civilian side, I think because there have been uh, a lot, you know, that didn't have those restrictions in place, we didn't kind of start with some of those disadvantages like we did in some of our active duty communities. But we still have a long way to go. I'm very proud of the uh, Navy Intelligence Committee and uh, uh, Sandy Brown and Zeb Goldrich. You know, when uh, when I talk to them about that, you know, they they have they have some tremendous programs in place. And in fact, our hiring last year uh, are of new entry level hires, you know, 41 percent, uh, you know, minorities, 48 percent uh, women. Uh, they have uh, right now uh, uh, either uh, underway or shortly forming. Uh, resource groups uh, for uh, different women and minority sets that are actively, you know, engaged uh, and trying uh, and, uh, and, 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 and providing sort of resources for outlet. I've asked for, <clears throat> excuse me, feedback from those, from those groups. Early on in my tenure at an all hands, I really stuck my foot in the mouth when somebody asked me about the incidents surrounding the George Floyd uh, upheaval that was going on. And I even just some very insensitive language that might have been common uh, to me uh, based on where I come from and my background. I didn't realize I made I made some of my own staff uh, kind of angry with some of the language I use. So I have benefited uh, from some of that feedback. We've got a long way. Uh, we've got a long way to go. Uh, we have enthusiastically embraced the. Uh, Office of Director of National Intelligence, a small steps uh, campaign, those little steps you can take about inclusivity, uh, just inviting one more person, including one more person, uh, listening uh, to one more person. So we've, uh, I think we've, uh, we've taken some giant steps here in Naval Intelligence and our INW community, but a long way to go, and we can never take the eye off the ball. 
Well, thank you for sharing that. And that's going to end up being my last question. We are uh, at the end of our time uh, this afternoon. But I do want to give you a chance, though, uh, Admiral, uh, if you have any closing thoughts you'd like to, to share with us, um, uh, love, would love to, to hear those and any last, last thoughts you'd like to share. Hey, thank you. Uh, I, I just consider it a, a privilege uh, to keep working, uh, one, uh, in our great Navy, and then, uh, but also now uh, supporting the intelligence and national security community. Uh, there are, uh, I, I hope, I hope, some of the folks that have uh, helped me out along the way are, uh, are on the line listening because there have uh, been some real uh, uh, leaders out there that I have, uh, I have learned from. Uh, uh, Tish Long has helped me out quite a bit, Sue Gordon, Stephanie O'Sullivan, Lynn Wright uh, out there that's helped me. I've got a uh, tremendous uh, deputy director of Naval Intelligence, uh, Scott Bray, and uh, his deputy, Sandy Brown. Uh, that support me in Navy intelligence. Uh, a tremendous community. Like I said, uh, the information warfare community in the Navy is only 11 years old. Uh, we have just, we've every three years, we have evolved to uh, one of the big organ, you know, bigger organizations like the Information Forces Command, the uh, Information mm -hmm. Fighting Development Center. You know, the steps to look like a regular community and combine that now have information. Uh, warfare commanders at sea on aircraft carriers supporting the strike group commander. We've taken giant steps, but like with everything, the peak of that mountain is still a long way up and we're evolving every day. A tremendous privilege to work with these professionals and to inter, uh, interact and integrate uh, with the professionals of the community at large. Thank you very much. Well, thank you. And thank you again. It's been terrific to, to host you this afternoon and for your candid comments and insights. Um, and for everyone online that's been with us, thank you as well uh, for joining us and a shout out uh, to Mantech uh, for their sponsorship of the, the program today. Looking ahead, um, I do wanna uh, let you know we have a number of things planned in the month ahead in February. On the 2nd of February, we'll host Lieutenant General Mary O'Brien, who's the Air Force Deputy Chief of Staff for ISR and Cyber Effects Operations. And she'll be joining us for coffee and conversation. Uh, on the 11th of February, we're hosting Lieutenant General Scott Barrier, who's the director of the Defense Intelligence Agency for a leadership luncheon. And on the 17th of February, we'll be hosting our annual event called the Achievement Awards Ceremony, where we'll honor six extraordinary early to mid-level professionals in the national security, IC, and homeland security communities. Uh, we're excited as well that Stacy Dixon, deputy director at NGA, will keynote uh, that event. Uh, closing out the month on the 23rd of February, we'll hold a coffee and conversation with Rita Sampson, who's the chief of the IC's EEO and diversity effort at ODNI. And on the 24th of February, we'll welcome Mr. Bill Litzow, who's the director of the Defense Counterintelligence and Security Agency to our Wednesday Wisdom Program. All of these uh, uh, events and more are available for you to take a look at on our website. InsaOnline.org, uh, and all the details are there. Uh, hey, when the webinar ends today, we hope you'll take a minute to answer a brief survey that'll pop up uh, and, and let us know how we did, and also if you have any recommendations for future speakers. This concludes today's program. Stay safe, healthy, and have a good afternoon. <laughs>